Let's get it. Mike Semper VV here with you for the next hour talking about professional wrestling, which is something we do every single day here on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. Tune in, iHeart, American Forces Radio, sportsbyline.com, over the air affiliates like KMAV, 99 KMSR, and the Mightier 1090. Maybe you're listening on podcast or replay on Sirius XM, or maybe you're video streaming on Twitch or YouTube. However, you're joining me today, I'd just like to say thank you. Hopefully, wherever you are, it's sunny outside. If not, hopefully, it's sunny inside your mind. Beautiful day here on Delmarva, a little chilly. Last time I was on, on a Friday with you, I was talking about how nice it was. People in the Pacific Northwest were rolling their eyes because the frost has already hit. Well, guess what? It finally worked its way over here Had the first frost of the winter season. It's probably going to be a, a long winter for me, but that's all right. Got a long way to go before we get there, and there's going to be a whole lot of wrestling in in the process. Look how much is taking place this weekend. WWE Crown Jewel is streaming Saturday on Peacock on the WWE Network as well. A sports-washing tradition every year emanating from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The kickoff show will begin tomorrow at noon Eastern. 1 p.m. is the main show. We'll run down that card, and I'll give you my thoughts on each match and the direction I think they'll go. The fact that the show is earlier in the day in the States is a blessing for AEW Collision, which airs as it usually does on Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern. We've seen both NXT and WWE events cause them harm head-to-head. We'll know on Tuesday how everything turns out. There are two pretty big college football games that are going to cause them problems. I'll note those when we run down the card. Also this weekend is the New Japan Pro Wrestling Power Struggle event in Osaka, which features appearances by John Moxley and Will Ospreay. I'll run down that card and give you my predictions there too. As well as Vince McMahon, 86 in a deal that would have seen the UFC air on USA. And Ric Flair being signed by AEW. Wrestling Observer Live. Back to the show, Mike Semper VV here with you. We do this show right here for an hour at a time every single day, but if you want us 24-7, you can try to find us on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it. I am at Semper VV. You can follow Filthy Tom Lawler at, no surprise, Filthy Tom Lawler. He's not here with me today because he is currently en route to Indiana to fight for Paradigm Pro. Some chump named Ron Mathis is going to get beaten up tonight. So if you want to follow along and find out if Tom breaks both hands or maybe just one on this man's face, you can do that at Filthy Tom Lawler and, of course, at Sports Byline USA. I'd also like for you to make the wrestling news part of your day, everything you need to know to get your day started, get you up to date, or get you to your favorite wrestling review pod, daily free in between 5 and 15 minutes every single day. No clickbait, no speculation, no rumors, no paywall, just the wrestling news. For more information, head on over to the wrestlingnews.com and at Wrestling News AV on Facebook and Twitter. I'll get this out of the way for the ASMR kids. Everybody quiet down. There you go. The Winter Edition Red Bull, the Pear Cinnamon. I still enjoy this right now. I am amazed at what Dana White enjoys. He he, uh, he may be a big S&M fan, maybe, I guess, because he just loves having somebody dominate him and slap him around and, and like somebody who, who's got bigger grapefruits than him, you know, just just messing up all of his business decisions in the past. Apparently, UFC CEO Dana White revealed that Vince McMahon nixed a past TV deal that would have seen the UFC head to NBC and the USA Network. I just saw this. It was posted up to the front page of the website this afternoon by our own Josh Nason. Dana was speaking on the Triggered podcast. I don't know who the hosts are for for that podcast there, but he was asked about his relationship with McMahon, a topic that has come up frequently with White in recent interviews now that everybody is under the Endeavor umbrella together. White again spoke about how McMahon and the UFC had their battles in the past as McMahon saw everyone as competition and that he, quote, He was one of those guys who would effing stick it up to me for whatever reason, end quote. 
White then went into specific detail that he had never delved into before, saying that the UFC was on the one-yard line to sign a new deal with NBC to air fights on both NBC and the USA Network. However, at that point, the WWE the WWE head had the final say on whether another combat sports property could come onto USA's airwaves. White said that he and then-owner UFC co-owner Lorenzo Fertitta flew out to Connecticut to meet with McMahon and get his sign-off on the deal. After some small talk, they got to the point of their visit, and McMahon sat back in his chair and said, Yeah, I'm not going to do that. When they asked why, White said that McMahon said, eh, I'm not that interested in it. I don't like the idea of you guys on USA Network. Pal. I added the pal at the end. After the deal blew up, UFC then pivoted and eventually signed a seven-year deal with Fox in August of 2011. While White did not specify the timeline of when the McMahon talk happened, it is assumed to be in 2011 based on the timeline. White said that now he and McMahon, executive chairman of TKO Holdings, are in business together. Quote, he couldn't be a better partner. He keeps me in the loop with everything going on, making sure I'm cool with decisions that could affect the UFC. End quote. I believe this is when the UFC would have signed their deal with the Fox Network. And with hindsight being 2020. That was probably a better move for UFC, and it was probably a better move for mixed martial arts on network television. I think of all of the major networks, we saw CBS try it, and immediately the Tiffany Network got some very cold feet after the brawl broke out at Elite XC, or it wasn't Strike Force then, I guess it was Elite XC, where, where the fight ended up breaking out with the Diaz brothers and all that, Mayhem Miller and all that stuff went down. And they were done with it real quick after that. It got banished to Showtime, and, and that was pretty much it. Honestly, I, I think Fox was the perfect place for the UFC to go. I think if it would have went right to NBC, sure, USA Network probably would have been good with it. They, for years, Tuesday night fights on the USA Network, uh, Barry Tompkins and Sean O'Grady, that was the team I remember the most. Uh, Barry Tompkins and Al Michaels, you know, on, on Friday night fights. You know, on the USA Network, that sort of thing I think would have been no problem. Airing specials or prelims on NBC? I don't know. I think the way everything worked out, Fox was the right way to go. And now we don't really see anybody bat an eye. I'm sure somebody at ABC slash ESPN doesn't like to see those fights on in the background while they're working or whatever. They'd rather see car racing or something else on in its place. But, you know, when it comes to networks now, it's no big deal to see fighting on in the middle of the afternoon, which was something that... You know, back in 2011, even though it doesn't seem like it's all that long ago, you know, a lot of people were still horrified at the thought <laughs> of seeing uh, the, the UFC on there. So it is, uh, it's interesting. Dana White always seems to have great enjoyment talking about how Vince has slapped him down in business dealings. It kind of gives you a, a glimpse into the, the mind of Dana White there uh, <laughs> that Vince, again, you know, he is the the big dog that Dana looks up to. You don't hear him talk about Bob Arum with any, you know, special feeling, Don King, anybody from the boxing world where he got his start. It really comes down to Vince McMahon as his ideal promoter. WWE SmackDown is tonight from the Fizzerv Forum in Milwaukee. This was taped after last Friday night's telecast in order to accommodate travel for this Saturday's Crown Jewel event in Saudi Arabia. They announced on WWE.com yesterday that Ridge Holland and Butch of the Brawling Brutes will take on Pretty Deadlies, Kit Wilson and Elton Prince in a Donnie Brook rules bout on the show. It says here that WWE.com describes a Donnie Brook rules match as a quote free for all melee with lots of weapons at their disposal end quote it's a lot of basic matches now you end up seeing all that stuff end up breaking out there also added to friday's card for those of you who have remained spoiler free kevin owens will go one-on-one -on -one with austin theory the match will be a follow-up from an angle on last week's episode where owens attacked theory backstage also on the show will be a United States Championship weigh-in between Rey Mysterio and his challenger on Saturday, Logan Paul. 
And Bianca Belair returns to the ring and faces Damage Control's Bailey. Crown Jewel taking place from the Mohammed Abdo Arena in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Like I said, 1 p.m. Eastern time for the main card. Noon for the pre-show. At some point during that pre-show, we will have a kickoff match between Sami Zayn and J.D. McDonough. And they're not beating Sami Zayn in Saudi Arabia. I wouldn't think uh, now that he is back, able to go on these tours, Sami Zayn gets the victory in that match. I don't know if this card is in order. Looks like it probably is because the way it's listed, it is bookended with world title matches. The first one being the WWE women's title match, EO Sky against Bianca Belair. I don't know if Charlotte Flair is in Saudi Arabia or if she's going to be a part of the house shows coming up this weekend. There is one in Rochester, New York, and another in Springfield, Massachusetts on Saturday and Sunday. So I don't know if she is going to be a part of those shows. But if she is not, I could see her maybe getting involved, causing Bianca Belair to, to possibly lose the match. What you could also see, and I'll get to in a little more detail with this later on, is Kyrie Sane possibly making an appearance and costing Bianca Belair the match against EO Sky. I, if that doesn't happen and there's no interference, I say, okay, go ahead and give the belt to Bianca. But I got to be honest, I think there's more chase left for Bianca. And I think a to cut EO Sky at this point in her title reign, again, unless you have something really good planned for Bianca winning it, I think it's okay to hold off on that a little bit. Cody Rhodes faces Damian Priest in a singles bout. I have a feeling something is going to happen with Damian Priest a little bit later on in the show. So I think Cody Rhodes is going to get the victory over him. John Cena against Solo Sokoa. I'm going with John Cena in that match. The United States title match between Rey Mysterio and Logan Paul. I'm really up in the air on this one. You could go either way. I say go ahead and give the belt to Logan Paul. He's got no fights planned for right now. He can hang around, certainly be a thorn in everyone's side leading into the Royal Rumble. I'm all for it. Got a couple more matches on that show to get into, as well as a whole lot more coming up this weekend. We'll be back, Wrestling Observer Live. Back on the show, Mike Semper BB here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. Brian Alvarez will be back with me on Monday, taking a look at everything that took place over the weekend. If you cannot wait that long and you need some more Brian Alvarez in your life, well, the Brian and Vinny show will take place Sunday night. But even before that, on Saturday night, I assume overnight, unless something bizarre happens here, I would have to assume that Brian Alvarez and Dave Meltzer will be back for subscribers for Wrestling Observer Radio, running down everything that takes place at Crown Jewel. I'm running down the rest of that show right now for you. WWE Women's World Title, Fatal Five-Way, Rhea Ripley against Nia Jax against Zoe Stark, Shayna Baszler, and Raquel Rodriguez. Why would you take the title off of Rhea Ripley? Why? I don't know. I, I wouldn't take the title off of Rhea Ripley. No reason to do that. Just gets five women into that match in Saudi Arabia. That's fine. Cool. Rhea Ripley comes back with the belt. WWE World Heavyweight title. Seth Rollins against Drew McIntyre. Okay. This is, this is what I'm thinking here. Seth Rollins wins this match, but he is in bad shape. And I'm not sure how this is going to happen, but I do know that Drew McIntyre will be pissed off when it happens. He will be would have gotten screwed, and, and somehow Seth Rollins holds on to that belt. And he can complain about it all he wants, but out will come Damian Priest to go ahead and cash in on Seth Rollins. We have a world title change quote-unquote, in Saudi Arabia. Damian Priest comes back with the belt. And again, the the divide between he and the rest of the Judgment Day can continue on. I still believe that Drew McIntyre would be the perfect replacement for him, much more than a Randy Orton or anybody like that. I think Drew McIntyre replacing Damian Priest in that unit would be, uh, to me, the way to do it. And then you have Damian Priest, 
going up against Seth Rollins. Maybe if Seth Rollins is screwed over by Shinsuke Nakamura or somebody like that, he can get out of the title picture. And right there it is, all set up. Drew McIntyre against Damian Priest. And oh yeah, if Cody Rhodes defeats Damian Priest earlier on in the show, you can have he and, and Cody Rhodes, Damian Priest and Cody Rhodes, do battle for the belt at some point as you lead into WrestleMania season at the beginning of the year. Undisputed, universal, world, global, planetary title, whatever it is, held by Roman Reigns alongside Paul Heyman against L.A. Knight. L.A. Knight has been red hot. He has been no signs really of cooling off right now. He seems to be consistently right there with what people want. He is going to get screwed over somehow in this match against Roman Reigns. We may see a very clean three count you know when it comes to the visual pin but something will probably go down i'm thinking in my mind some sort of distraction some sort of nonsense because of solo or or jimmy uso or something like that where la knight takes the l and we come back to the states with roman reigns continuing to be the undisputed universal world heavyweight champion there you go that's what i think uh, about crown jewel we still have, you know, a couple of shows before we, we get to Crown Jewel. Um, before I get to SmackDown, though, I will say, Kari Sane to me is, I don't know when she's going to be back in WWE officially, but it has been reported that she has been added to the internal roster. This was posted up on the F4WOnline.com front page this morning by Ethan Renner. On Thursday, Russell Votes first reported that Kyrie Sane has been added to WWE's internal roster, signaling her impending return to the company. Sane, a former NXT Women's Champion and WWE Women's Tag Team Champion, left the company in 2021 and last wrestled for WWE in 2020. It was reported in August that she was on her way back to WWE after fulfilling the remainder of her dates in Japan. Sane finished up with stardom in October. Hmm. So her return is uh is coming here. And again, could she make her presence felt this weekend in Saudi Arabia? She could. You know, whether EO Sky or Bianca Belair wins, do you you could also do something where Kyrie Sane is waiting for her for for whoever the winner is when they get back. Not sure. Not even sure if she's going to be on the SmackDown roster, you know, either. So it'll be interesting to see what she does. Her presence is, and I'm not saying it's been missed, but her re-addition to that women's roster just makes it even better. Uh, you know, whereas Nia Jax's uh, didn't. You know, Kyrie Sane being there, mixing it up with Bianca Belair, you know, who has gotten so much better since Kyrie was there last. The same thing with Rhea Ripley and the character that she has become now. Obviously, you still have Charlotte Flair there. You still have Io Sky. You still have Asuka. There are a lot of really good women up on the women's roster. At some point, we're going to see Tiffany Stratton up there, too. So they do have a great core of women's wrestlers up there. So Kyrie Sane coming back to add to that, that's cool with me. I'll also note here, too, uh, speaking of people who will be returning soon, that AJ Styles is reportedly expected back on the main roster soon. PW Insider is reporting that Styles is scheduled to return on next week's edition of the show on November 10th and will be back regularly from that point on. He's been gone since filming an injury angle that aired on the September 22nd SmackDown, which basically opened up the door for LA Knight to come along and get the title shot that he he's getting tomorrow at crown jewel the rest of the oc has been gone from wwe programming as well carl anderson and his wife just had their fifth child earlier on this week so he is not there luke gallows has been dealing with a knee injury so he has not been there nishan has been there she's been wrestling dark matches uh for at smackdown tapings either teaming with shotzi or zelina vega and wrestling alba fire and, and isla dawn they're another twosome. We saw vignettes airing that they were going to be coming back. You know, it seems to be they're in a holding pattern right now. But if Chelsea Green and Piper Niven can go over there and lose those titles to Alba Fire and Isla Dawn, I will be quite happy about that so we can go ahead and maybe actually do something with those tag team title belts for the women's division. 
Uh, coming up on SmackDown tonight. Uh, did, did I already go through that? Did, did I already go through SmackDown? Let me see here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. I did at the very beginning of the show, but they have. Let's see. Nah, I pretty much said it all when it comes to SmackDown. Really, nothing else on there uh, other than what I said at the the beginning of the show. Uh, AEW Rampage is also tonight as well, too. That's another tape show, uh, as it usually is. KFC Yum Center, Louisville, Kentucky, after Dynamite. No spoilers here either. A three-way match, Eo Del Vikingo against Penta against Commander. Sky Blue faces Marina Shafir, Daniel Garcia against Trent Beretta, and Austin and Colton Gunn against Christopher Daniels and Matt Seidel. So that's coming up at 10 o'clock Eastern time uh, when SmackDown goes off the air. AEW Collision will be held live in Wichita, Kansas on Saturday from the Intrust Bank Arena. And in a promo released on social media Thursday, Prince Nana announced that the Gates of Agony will team with the AEW Tag Team Champions Ricky Starks and Big Bill against FTR, Roosh, and Preston Vance. That is going to be taking place on Saturday's episode. The match follows up an angle from last week's collision where Roosh Dorlistico and Preston Vance, along with Jose the Assistant, saved FTR from an attack by Starks and Big Bill. AR Fox against Swerve Strickland is also scheduled, as well as Lance Archer and Darby Allen. And yes, the national 69-day celebration with the acclaimed and Billy Gunn on there. AEW ratings news. We mentioned it uh, as we went off the air yesterday. Uh, the Wednesday edition of Dynamite drew a total audience of 832,000 to TBS, uh, up from last week's audience of 774,000. That comes despite the final game of the World Series between Texas and Arizona that actually saw a no-hitter getting taken into the seventh inning. In the key 18- to 49-year-old demographic, the show drew a .28 rating, up from last week's .28. Two, four. So really, again, you everybody wants to throw arrows back and forth over ratings. If you're you're still into doing that, the bottom line is it was a good number going up against the World Series, and it up significantly from the week before. Now, with what you saw on there, were you happy about what took place? Will you be tuning in next week? We'll have to see how those numbers go. But at least now baseball is out of the way football is still in the way and will be in the way for collision on saturday obviously a full slate of games across networks the biggest ones that are going to have an effect on collision are going to be number five washington against number 20 usc 730 on the abc network and then number 14 lsu against number eight alabama at 745 on cbs i don't know why lsu and usc are ranked to be honest at this point except be, they wanted the game to look shinier when, when they they prop these up there neither one of those teams should be in the top 25 usc really shouldn't be in the top 25 and michael Penix is probably going to have like seven touchdowns tomorrow that's what i'm expecting with that usc defense going to be terrible but there's a bunch of other games as well including number three michigan who's had a lot of talk and controversy this week whether that helps nbc's numbers for the game that goes head up against collision we'll find all that out on tuesday got a lot more to get into and we shall do so when we get back from break wrestling observer live back on the show mike semper vivi here with you wrestling observer live right flying solo today filthy tom lawler and root will be fighting for paradigm pro tonight you can check that show out and again i'll tweet out all the information on that when the show is over at semper vivi you can follow him at filthy tom lawler Big boss man Brian Alvarez will be back with me on Monday in this chair. But as I mentioned last segment, if you want him sooner than that, he and Dave will be doing a show after Crown Jewel on Saturday, as well as the Brian and Vinny show returning for subscribers over at F4WOnline.com on Sunday. One of the other things that you get when you're a subscriber to F4WOnline.com is the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. And according to that newsletter, Dragon Lee has officially signed a main roster deal. For those of you who like keeping track of such things, Dave wrote, Dragon Lee signed his new main roster deal last week. 
basically made it worth it to him for having signed the NXT deal rather than the offered AEW deal. As noted, he went to people who knew the U.S. scene, who told him he'd be lost in the shuffle in AEW. Previously, people would have said not to go to WWE given their track record with all wrestlers who came from Mexico besides Alberto Del Rio. Lee picked up a victory over Cedric Alexander on SmackDown last week. He signed with WWE in December 2022 and debuted for NXT this March. Lee's brothers, Roosh and Drillistico, are both signed to AEW. It's a big deal for Dragon Lee personally that he was able to get this main roster deal. And if you are a fan of Dragon Lee, you are happy to hear that news. Why? If he had an NXT deal already, is it that big of a deal? Because it's a lot more money. And one would have to assume AEW offered him more money to join them. And he didn't. He decided to take an NXT deal, which, again, it's not like you're crying for any of those folks, but it is nothing like a main roster deal. And, you know, again, his ability to earn in Mexico and AEW and other places, you know, it, it, to take a cut like that, you really got to believe in yourself and you got to hope that they were going to do something with him, and they have. He's up on the main roster right now. We'll see how they use him now that he is up there. They have desperately needed a replacement for Rey Mysterio Jr. They have had so many opportunities. They had one with Santos Escobar. I don't know what direction they're they're going to be going there, but there it, it is a graveyard of, of littered bodies uh, for somebody who could be the next big Mexican star coming over to America or the next big luchador, the next big masked figure. I mean, to me, that's even more important than anything is the fact that you sell masks. You, you know, the, the fact that they've just been so poor with how they've treated everybody when one of the mo most important things to WWE is merchandise. And again, with the exception of Rey Mysterio, what masks have you been able to sell? It's not like you got Grand Metallic to a level where you could, you know, or the rest of the Lucha House Party to a point where you could sell their masks and anybody would actually want them. So... Hopefully this works out. He's an incredibly talented guy. We've seen him in there. He had a great match. I mean, look how good he made Dominic Mysterio look in that first match. And that's nothing against Dominic Mysterio, but we saw Dominic Mysterio against Nathan Frazier this past week. Sometimes he's got to be in there with the right guy, and Dragon Lee was perfect for him. So I hope at some point he truly can. Somebody can take that torch away and carry it for luchadors in the WWE. Uh, just because how many more times can you trot out Rey Mysterio out there? My God, it's amazing that he's even able to move at this point, let alone go like he does in the ring. And we're going to find that out again tomorrow with Logan Paul and what probably is going to be a super fun match, if nothing else. Ric Flair has signed a multi-year contract with AEW, according to an official press release yesterday. I did not hear Ric Flair and his agent on with... Dave Meltzer and Garrett Gonzalez on yesterday's Wrestling Observer Radio, which is up for subscribers on the site. So I can't speak to anything that was said on there. But said Tony Khan in a statement, quote, Rick cemented his legacy as one of the greatest professional wrestlers of all time long ago. And now his world-renowned persona and his amazing wrestling mind will be major assets to AEW's programming and our position globally. Most importantly, it's fitting that the final chapter of Sting's iconic career will unfold on TBS with Ric Flair by his side, end quote. The announcement comes after Flair made his first surprise appearance in AEW on last Saturday night's collision to show his support for his longtime friend and in-ring rival Sting, who had announced his upcoming retirement in 2024. Apparently, I saw it mentioned somewhere that Flair's woo... Ooh, I just you know at this point, there's it, it doesn't it doesn't deserve a flair in his prime like woo for this you know it's just the energy drink is going to be offsetting some of the salary and the energy drink will become the official beverage of AEW. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with the Red Bull here you know that that's enough. Uh, I'll never try this in the same way that I've I've never tried Prime the Logan Paul drink but. 
Ric Flair's amazing wrestling mind will be a major asset to w- AEW's programming and our position globally. What amazing wrestling mind? Ric Flair is one of my greatest pro wrestlers of all time, period, point blank. He may be the greatest pro wrestler of all time, depending on how you look at things. Growing up, he, Ricky Steamboat, Jay Youngblood, Wahoo McDaniel, Dusty Rhodes, I mean, all Sergeant Slaughter, all those huge influence on me, was my favorite professional wrestler. Ric Flair, when he was the head booker for WCW, he was busy. And he had a group of people that he put into place. Now, he put the right people into place. When you include Kevin Sullivan and Jim Cornette. And this is going back to the time where, you know, he had this. Jim Ross. It was Jody Hamilton. I think he was, well, he was more of a WCW-placed person. But he knew the people that he wanted. And they knew the type of wrestling that Ric Flair liked. And that's how that worked. And I'm not saying that Ric Flair's got no ideas whatsoever. But he's going to be 75 years old next year in February. He's gone through a lot, (laughs) a lot, you know. He has soaked his brain uh, pretty well with alcohol. Uh, He's almost died. He's had a lot on him. And you hear him tell stories now. And he's not to the level of, like, Hulk Hogan. Nowhere near that, where he's just that nuts. But, like... You know, putting himself in Puerto Rico when Bruiser Brody was murdered and stuff like that. It's like, I don't see Ric Flair being an amazing wrestling mind that can help that program out. What what, what can he add to the program? What can he add that Arn Anderson couldn't add? What could he add that any of the other people, the, the older folks that were brought in, couldn't add? You know, to me, I, I don't know. I don't know. Jake Roberts has got a better reputation with a better wrestling mind. And I don't know if they were really able to do anything and get anything out of him. I guess if the drink company is paying for it, I, I guess that makes it worth it. But to me, I, I again, I, I was a huge, I'm the biggest Ric Flair fan for a long time. I don't want to see him out there anymore. I don't necessarily need to see him tied to Sting. I don't want to have. I hope this isn't a case where they're trying to get Ric Flair one last match, even if he's just hanging on the ropes the entire time. Sting can have a singles match. We know what Sting can do. My God, look at what that dude has done in the time that he's been there. I want to see Sting go out with a singles match against somebody, and I don't want it to be Ric Flair. And you know, yes, you know, yeah. The when when TBS. Uh, first got rid of WCW, you know, that last Nitro, we had Flair out there in the shirt on wrestling Sting because that's how it should have been. And I don't know if Tony's got that in his mind. I I hope that's, I I can't believe that would be the case. I hope it's not. I really do. I really, and I don't want to see Ric Flair turn on Sting one more time for old time's sake or anything like that either. I I just don't, I guess really what I'm saying is I just don't want to see Ric Flair involved at all. I'm kind of got Ric Flair fatigue after all this time. I got to be honest, I bought the the Dames because I'm a big fan of Damian Lillard's Adidas. And I got to be honest, I got they had the white pair and the blue pair. I did get a pair of the white Ric Flair shoes. Was, well, I get most of the Dames to come out. It's not that I, I hate Ric Flair. But I look at the chat. I look at the forum on F4WOnline.com. I look at my Twitter feed. And I don't think I'm the only one that's got Ric Flair fatigue and doesn't want to see him on there. Not even for anything morally with him when it comes to the plane ride from hell to hell, where it comes to people now wanting to relook at how Ric Flair, Ric Flair stories from the seventies and eighties and things like that. And, and apply today's eyes onto those things. I don't, you could throw all of that out. I just don't think as a personality, I really need to see him out there, but we'll see how, what they do with him. I'm open to it, I guess, because I am a big fan of Sting and I want to see him have, you know, a proper retirement and a good send off. And I believe that Tony Khan will, you know, facilitate that, but helping to facilitate Ric Flair in professional wrestling at this point, I'm tapped out on it, tapped out on it. New Japan Pro Wrestling. 
Power struggle at the Etihad Arena in Osaka early Saturday morning for those of us here in North America. John Moxley against the Great Okan. Just remember, folks, Brian Alvarez hated the Great Okan, hated the thought of him coming back, Was said the same thing about Yoda Suji. Remember how much he rolled his eyes? Was wrong about both of them for different reasons. The Great Okan is a great gimmick. He and John Moxley is probably going to be, at times, a surprisingly fun match. I think it's going to be probably a fun match anyway because of the pillage and the carnage that can happen with those two guys in the ring. But again, John Moxley fancying himself a, a shoot style wrestler in the great Okan, who is a, a very, very uh, solid college wrestler, a very solid uh, shoot style wrestler when he wants to. So that ought to be fun. Tangaloa against David Finley. If it was up to me, Gabe Kidd would be the leader of the Bullet Club. But David Finley against Tangaloa is the match. I'm going to go ahead and give David Finley the victory there. The same way I'm going to give the victory to John Moxley against the Great Okan. Tetsuya Naito and Yoda Suji against Sonata and Yuya Uemura. I could see there being a case since Yuya Uemura still wants a match against Sonata. He said that when he returned and joined up with Sonata in the Just Five Guys stable, that there may be miscommunication. And Tetsuya Naito pins the IWGP champion Sonata, and then we get Sonata and Uemura before we reach the Tokyo Dome. Jome? Yeah, something like that. Super Junior Tag League 2023 Final Catch 2-2. Francesco Akira and TJP against the House of Torture show. And Yoshinobu Kanemaru. I am taking Akira and TJP in that. Never open weight six-man tag team title. Kazuchika Okada, Tomohiro Ishii, and Hiroshi Tanahashi against TMDK's Mikey Nichols, Shane Haste, and Zack Sabre Jr. I'm taking TMDK in that one. IWGP Junior Heavyweight title. Hiromu Takahashi against Taiji Shimori. My money's on Hiromu Takahashi. And then the IWGP United States heavyweight title. Will Ospreay against Shota Umino? Man, Shota Umino getting an upset victory here? I think it's still probably a long shot. But I, what I don't think is a long shot is that Will Ospreay is not long for New Japan Pro Wrestling. And at some point after the Tokyo Dome, we see him signed up somewhere else which is why I think Umino has got a shot coming up late, late tonight, early tomorrow morning. We'll be back and put a bow on this thing. Wrestling Observer Live. Back on the show, Mike Semper, BB here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. Put a bow on this thing as we, we exit out of here on a Friday. It is Friday, so you know there's a CMLL show at Arena Mexico. I always like this one every year, the annual Dia del Muerto show. The, the themed show where losers of matches are often dragged to hell in front of traditionally garbed and made up Edekanis. It's always a fun show. Uh, the main event is going to be Stuka Jr. against Bavaro Cavanario in the final of the Rey del Inframundo tournament. Mascara Dorada and Mystico against Soberano Jr. and Volador Jr. as well on the show. This is a little more expensive, though. This is like last week's show, the Amazones Tournament, which was won by Tessa Blanchard over Stephanie Vacare. Usually the show is four ninety nine. It is a and it's a great value usually to watch the CMLO show uh, through their Ticketmaster, Boletia service, whatever the name of it is. These past two weeks, it has been close to twenty bucks. So that is one warning if you're gonna check out the show tonight, you haven't before, but want to see all. The, the pomp and circumstance that goes along with this show just be forewarned 20 bucks and also they've had issues apparently the last two weeks i know they definitely did two weeks ago i haven't seen last week's show the vod was fine on that but live airings they've had a little bit of trouble the last two weeks so you are warned GCW also running two shows this weekend at well as well. The first one of uh, is going to be in Saget, Illinois tonight at Pops Nightclub, main evented by Blake Christian against Warhorse for the GCW World Title, and then GCW C or No will take place at Center Stage in Atlanta on Saturday night. Jimmy Lloyd against Steph Delander, Mike Bailey against Santana Jackson. But the GCW world title, Blake Christian against Tank. NWA wild side memories there. Good stuff uh, going up and down the rest of that card as well. But I got to get out of here. Thanks for listening, everybody. 
Thank you to uh, producer Daniel. Thank you to producer John. And I shall talk to you again after a while.